Welcome to Case Unsolved. Tonight, the murder of a young woman from Liverpool, who was strangled and her body was dumped in a carrot field. First, it's September 1974, and a father of three from Bolton is found battered and bleeding to death in his garage. Tom Hewitt died the following day in hospital. He was known as a ladies' man. So was his killer an irate husband who caught Tom out on an affair? Or was he the victim of a disillusioned business acquaintance? Until this day, detectives don't know. Even today, when I, I go out with my friends and things, and I go around, call around for them, and just, you know, just doing little things with a father and that, I still think I still think today I missed out on all just silly little things, missed out. On. Uh, Tom's family have grown up never knowing what happened. Uh, uh, to him, and uh, justice needs to be done. Tom Hewitt ran a garage in Bright Street, Bury. At the time of his death, uh, Tom was 30 years of age. Uh, he was uh, slim, a uh, man who enjoyed life to the full. Uh, he was married, but separated from his first wife, uh, living with a second partner, and had three children uh, by uh, those partners. The business itself was a, a small garage and a side street in Bury, but it was successful and uh, him and his partner did have a good reputation for workmanship. It was only a small garage and they used to be there till all hours at night, just you know, getting the work done, men and cars and that. The customers ranged from anywhere in the regions of the, the local clerk to the, the justices to local criminals. Tom uh, was a man who enjoyed the social side of life. He enjoyed being out in the, the pubs and clubs uh, at every opportunity. There would be very few attractive ladies who walked past Bright Street Garage who didn't uh, attract some attention uh, from Tom. Although it is always done in a light-hearted way. My father had supposedly had a reputation of being a ladies' man. But what I can gather from the family, that's not true at all. At the time of his father's death, he was separated from his mother. And we lived about 200 yards from his garage. Um, obviously, I was, I was too young to understand why they were separated. But with him living, working only 200 yards away, I used to go every day when I finished school, I used to go to the garage and, that, and see my dad and also stay with him at weekends and things. And there is no doubt whatsoever in my mind that Tom uh, was a man who uh, was very devoted to his children, albeit he had a, a Jack the Lad a reputation otherwise, he was very devoted to his children. When I was a kid, I used to like going out walking and things, and my dad always used to take me on the moors and I used to like that. One of my dad's favourite hobbies was motorbike racing, and we used to go all over the country watching him, him and his friend, Rob. and I think the year he got killed, he was going to go into the TT race, the Ironman TT race, but obviously he never got there. It's September the 6th, 1974, the middle of the oil crisis. Harold Wilson was the Prime Minister of a minority Labour government, and a second general election that year was about to be called. In the 48 hours before his death, as far as we discovered, Tom did nothing unusual. He, he went to work and went home in the, the evening. Uh, and on the day of his attack, he arrived at work as usual and started work in company with his partner in the garage. Up until about 11.15 when his partner uh, left to collect some uh, bits and pieces from other places. Uh, the next thing we are aware of is that at 11.35, uh, when a customer arriving at the garage uh, found uh, Tom lying injured and called for an ambulance. The man who found Tom found him lying uh, on the ground beside a vehicle that he had been repairing. Uh, and it was obvious from the blood around that, and the head injuries that something had happened. Uh, it was originally believed that possibly the car had fallen 
on top of him and injured him. Uh, but later inquiries revealed that he had been struck at least two heavy blows on the head uh, with a metal uh, instrument. He was still alive, but had suffered serious head injuries. An ambulance was then called, and he was taken first of all to Berry General Hospital, where he was examined, uh, but they realized immediately the seriousness of the injuries. It was about a month before my eighth birthday, and my sister would have been nine. And I actually found out that, not that he'd been killed, but that something had happened to him. I went, I was playing out on the street, and one of the kids on the street came up to me and said, oh, your dad's in hospital, someone's hit him, hit him over the head with a, a bar or something. So obviously I went back, to, went back home to ask my mum, and she told me. Obviously my mum was very upset. My sister was upset, but I didn't realise at the time it was, it was, it was so serious. I just thought he'd gone to hospital to have a few stitches or something like that. Tom was taken to Salford Royal Infirmary for emergency surgery, but died the following day. Detectives now had a murder hunt on their hands. A full-scale incident room was established at the Berry Police Station, uh, and within 24 hours, uh, approximately 70 detectives were working on what by that time was a murder inquiry. If people can cast their minds back to 1974, that was the year of the local government reorganisations and the formation of Greater Manchester Police. Uh, and this was actually the first major uh, investigation that was undertaken uh, by uh, Greater Manchester Police in its uh, newly formed state. Any murder inquiry, preservation of the scene is of prime importance. And unfortunately, in this case, uh, the scene had been uh, upset uh, by the uh, ambulance crews arriving and moving uh, things around. And also, the, the second problem was the, the location itself. A garage uh, covered in grease, and most, most surfaces covered in grease, was not a good place for forensic examination. It was extremely difficult and unproductive. The investigation then progressed by uh, tracing all customers uh, and people who Tom had connections with. Uh, including uh, any girlfriends uh, that we could uh, trace or any uh, connections that uh, we were able to establish. Uh, overall, over a period of time, in excess of 2,000 people were interviewed on the inquiry, uh, but uh, with, uh, obviously with no success. Inquiries focused on a mysterious stranger who'd been seen visiting the garage on two occasions when Tom wasn't there. The one uh, person who we never succeeded in tracing was described at the time as uh, the angry man. Are you Cottrell or Hewitt? Cottrell. Where's Hewitt? Looking at some scrap. Time I'm looking for him. Right. We do not know whether or not this man came back on Friday the 6th, uh, but clearly it was a possibility. And despite uh, numerous poster appeals and television appeals, uh, that uh, man never volunteered himself to us. The man was described at the time as being aged between 30 and 40, stocky and around 5 foot 11 tall, and wearing a suit. Looking back on the case 27 years later, uh, I think to myself that uh, we failed to uh, get across to the, the angry man, he failed to come forward. Uh, conducting a murder inquiry is, is a bit like doing a jigsaw puzzle where you don't have the pieces. Someone else has the pieces and you have to convince that person to give you those pieces. Uh, and obviously we didn't manage to convince someone to give us the right pieces. At this stage, so many years on, uh, there is an undoubtedly people who exist out there who know the answer to what happened to, to Tom Hewitt. Uh, there is the person who delivered the blows that killed him, and I have no doubt at all that there are other people who know who that person is and what he or she uh, did. The likeliest way that it would uh, come forward now is probably following a domestic dispute between uh, people who, who knew uh, and someone uh, wishing to avenge themselves on, on that person.
Despite the passing of more than 25 years, Tom's family are still desperate to find out the true identity of their father's killer. I'll never forget it. I'll, I'll not be able to say, oh, forget it, it's in the past, leave it. I'll never, I've got to put my mind at rest by having someone talk to court and punish for it. If there is anybody out there with any information, I'd urge them to come forward and just tell the police what they know. So I can put it to the back of my mind and get on with my life. For anyone who thinks they can help track down Tom's killer, we'll be giving you a number to ring at the end of the programme. Still to come though, the murder of a young woman from Liverpool. Did her involvement in the drugs world lead to her tragic death? Welcome back to Case Unsolved. Julie Fenley was a drug addict, a young woman from a respectable family who resorts to petty crime to support her heroin addiction. But she ends up strangled to death and her body being dumped in a carrot field. Julie's parents feel as though they lost their daughter twice. First a drug addiction, and then finally to a killer. A killer who's never been caught. Julie was a good little girl. She was pleasant, very pleasant. Ian and her sister got on very well together. She started school. Julie got into, like, drawing and uh, painting and always like a, a pen in her hand. She always wanted to be a hairdresser right from the beginning. She's always liked to fiddle around with your ear. And she always said to me, when I'm older, can I be at I said, I said, you be what you like. She was absolutely brilliant, beautiful. She could have been a model. She's so perfect in every way. But by the time Julie was 19, Pat Finley had started to notice a worrying change in her daughter. She had a lot of jewellery, what she saved up to buy, and noticed that they started disappearing. Then the clothes seemed to be going then. She wasn't interested in clothes no more, like she used to be, but she started losing weight. I said, Julie, you losing weight? She said, I'm on a diet. Then things started really worrying me. I said, Julie, not on no diet. I wanted to, you've got to tell me. And one day she broke down and she did tell me that she was on her own. And that really cut me up. I couldn't believe it, Julie going on her own. Maybe when she was taking drugs, I, um, I turned a blind, blind eye to her. And I wouldn't say a blind eye. Maybe I was naive to it. But I, it's what I'm saying to myself now. That one word, if I'd only done this, if I'd only said that, maybe things would have been different. It was August the 5th, 1994, and Julie had recently celebrated her 23rd birthday. As she did so often, she went to visit her mother. She had a snack and then took a bath. Afterwards, mother and daughter had the now familiar discussion about her drug addiction. Yeah, I feel loads better. I'm still worried about you, you know, Julie. You're still awful thin. You're going to have to sort yourself out with this drugs business. I mean, you've got to do it for yourself. No one else can do it for you. I know, Mum. I'm trying. Then Julie borrowed a small amount of money and left. 
Não, nunca um não. Se a pior pão a mim. Se dá para me ter ready, pipa para me ter um dia, né? Eu nunca vi nada That night, Julie left her flat, telling her boyfriend that she was going to get some drugs. The last person to see her alive was a woman driving a car. She narrowly avoided knocking Julie down. The girl was driving a car when suddenly Julie ran across, apparently to greet a man who was standing on the opposite footwalk. The girl fortunately avoided knocking her down uh, and Julie was never seen again. The following morning, 15 miles away on the Rainford Bypass, a group of cyclists were preparing for a time trial. They stopped in a lay-by, and one of the group went into an adjoining field. It was there that Julie's body was discovered. Mike! If that is there. She had been strangled, I believe, by a ligature. There was no sign of any of her clothing. We don't know how on earth she got out there. One presumes she was taken there in a vehicle. There are no signs that she was killed at that spot. So presumably she was either killed in another location, namely another house, or indeed in a vehicle. The police came and said they found her. I'm gonna say, no more Julie. Straight away, detectives knew it was going to be a difficult case to solve. There were no obvious witnesses and no forensic evidence. We have no scene to establish exactly where she was murdered. So the forensic evidence that will be forthcoming from that scene is not available to me. I should say that to date we've arrested some 23 men in connection with this inquiry. Of those, we've been able to eliminate a number of them. An awful lot of them, we've not been able to eliminate them. Obviously, following the arrest of any individual, we need to establish where they were at the time of the murder. And it's not always possible to do so satisfactorily. If a person is to say, I was at home, alone, how do we disprove it? We cannot keep them in the cells indefinitely. They have to be released. And that is the case. So a number of men who have been interviewed still remain suspect for this murder. There was, however, a very significant sighting in the lay-by by the Rainford Bypass. A couple who were returning from a restaurant having had dinner about 1.30 on the Saturday morning spotted a white transit van in the lay-by where Julie's body was to be found the following morning. The angle of the vehicle was such that it caused them to think it was rather unusual. It appeared to have been parked at an oblique angle to the curb. The driver was certain that it was a transit because he intended to buy a transit and took interest in the vehicle as he passed it. I believe that the occupants of the vehicle either saw whoever it was dispose of Julie's body or indeed were the culprits or culprit in the vehicle because the estimated time of her death coincided with the sighting. I made numerous appeals for people to come forward in absolute confidence, given that it might have been a courting couple, and nobody has done so. With over two million Ford Transits registered in Britain, it's an enormous problem for me to trace the occupants of the vehicle. If they're innocent, and they may well be, Please come forward in absolute confidence. I don't want to know or account to anybody else why they were there. All I want to know is what, if anything, did they see? Another breakthrough came with a phone call from a woman called Tina. She'd just returned from her honeymoon and was calling from a phone box in Blackpool. Tina said that on the night of the murder, Julie had arranged to meet a taxi driver, a man from Heighton. But Tina never got in touch with detectives again. I want to trace that taxi driver. The key to tracing the taxi driver is Tina. I appeal to Tina. It may well be that you were newly married 
and you didn't want your husband to know your former occupation, which was a prostitute. I understand that. Seven years have passed now. Things may be different. You may be able to come and speak to me. I will see you at any time or any place in absolute confidence. I want to know firsthand what it was Julie told you. You could be the key to catching this killer, so Tina, please contact me. It's just mean everything to us. And then that somebody has been caught for my daughter after seven years of torment, persecution, and depression, anxiety, everything, sleepless nights, everything, wondering who's done it. It could well have been a sexual attack that has gone wrong. It could well have been a robbery that's gone wrong. It could have been revenge. It could be any one of a number of reasons. Certainly the type of person who's done it is somebody who killed a girl in the prime of her life, abandoned her like a rag doll in a field. The type of person who's done this is a wicked killer. And she died in some car accident. Or died on a holiday, drowned or something. Or died of some incurable disease. Maybe I'll come to terms with that. They say, uh, time's a healer. But believe me, it's hard. I don't go to cemetery. I'll leave that up to my wife. The simple reason why I don't go to the cemetery is uh, the job's not finished yet. Maybe when they cast the person or persons who've done this to my poor girl, maybe I'll go. Detectives believe that someone somewhere has vital information that could help track down Julie's killer. If you think you can help, call in confidence the Crime Stoppers number will be showing in a moment. Next week, we'll be back here in Liverpool, reopening the files on a 70-year-old case, described by experts as the perfect murder. Until then, good night.